A little more than a year ago, the universe threw yet another curveball at astronomers across the planet. With a fast radio burst, which have always been extremely mysterious, coming from a region of space that should not have one. Previously, these things have usually been detected a tremendous distance away from our own galaxy. They are immensely powerful, immensely mysterious, and yet they've always been very far away. Way, but we recently detected one in the galaxy of M81, when although it is a considerable distance away from our own galaxy, it is in our own backyard in intergalactic terms. What is the distance? Well, less than 12 million light years. And although that sounds like a hell of a long way, usually we've detected these things billions of light years away. So this is quite unusual. And generally it's been thought that magnetars, very young neutron stars, are what causes these things. As a matter of fact, we detected a very weak fast radio burst in our own galaxy that does indeed seem to be caused by a magnetar. Are. But what's happening in M81 and in other locations has been extremely confusing to astronomers. According to Mohit Bardwaj, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, at McGill University in Montreal, who's the lead scientist on the discovery of repeating fast radio bursts, he said, quote, If the FRB is associated with M81, it's surprising that it's located at the outskirts of M81. There are no other localized repeating FRBs that have been discovered that far from their host galaxy. Having said that, it's worth bearing in mind that the origin of FRBs is still very much a mystery, and we're learning more about them with every new localization. That having been said, the man that I love to turn to when it comes to interstellar phenomena, Dr. Avi Loeb, who was the chair of the astrophysics department at Harvard University for a decade, has his own theories about what FRBs might be, or at least a portion of them. And that is an extremely efficient way to propel light sails, or rather radio sails, across the galaxy, or perhaps perhaps even intergalactic space at relativistic speeds. And perhaps, just perhaps, we're detecting these things all across the universe because extremely advanced civilizations come to the same conclusion that utilizing this sort of power is the most efficient way to travel from star to star. And perhaps we ourselves will come to the same conclusion in the distant future. Have I finally flipped my lid? Well, I'm going to make my best case for this explanation with Dr. Loeb's help in just a moment. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. I have been on the ups and downs as of late, actually for several weeks. I really haven't told anybody about this until recently. Going to be going into the doctor on Monday and seeing exactly what's wrong with me. I'm not going to go into all my symptoms or anything like that. All I can say is that I've decided that it seems to be serious enough for me to check into it. In the meantime, I'm doing my best to uh, put out content as I always have um, as rapidly as I possibly can. 
uh, you know, because unless I'm on death's doorstep, uh, I feel that I need to be putting out content for you folks as I've always committed to do. All right, all that having been said, let's move on. We are venturing now from the world of the contemporary spaceflight, contemporary astronomy, and maybe near future um, astrophysics and near future spaceflight to the world of the strange and the extraterrestrial to future Futurism, because as I have mentioned a number of times in my videos, I am an unapologetic futurist. I like to look not only ahead, but very far ahead as to what might be possible with technology that we can imagine today, that we can theorize about today, and that would be within the realm of possibility at least with technology that's in the vicinity of what we currently have. Of course, it would involve, you know, building projects on a level that we've never even come close to attempting, but still, it's something that we can at least conceive of. And this is the whole concept of interstellar travel by means of light sails, or more particularly, by means of fast radio burst light sails. And the reason I'm bringing up this uh, this in particular is because of what I mentioned uh, in the opening comments. The recent discovery made in the Galaxy M81 of a fast radio burst that has defied all description and all explanation in terms of natural explanations. And it's one of a number, actually. Fast radio bursts have always been an extreme mystery to astronomers and to astrophysicists. They've never really been able to tie it down. For a while, when we detected a very weak fast radio burst in our own galaxy and traced it back to a magnetar, which is an early life cycle neutron star that's giving off, it's very active, giving off lots of radiation, lots of radio waves, etc. Very powerful. You know, this is what we thought they were. This is where we thought they were coming from. At least that's what some people thought. And they jumped almost immediately to that conclusion and announced to the world that this was the source of fast radio bursts when everybody really knew that that wasn't the case, that it didn't cover all of them at all. Um, and we have detected quite a few of them in the last few years, but this most recent one, detected from the galaxy of M81, this one defies all description. It is a repeating fast radio burst. So it just keeps happening on the same frequency, sweeping across our field of view, if you perhaps, or just simply bursting out. It's hard to say exactly what's causing it because there are no magnetars in the area or anything else obvious in the globular cluster where it is located that could possibly be generating this. No natural explanation for this whatsoever. Of course, any articles that are written about this also are quick to say that it's not aliens. Definitely not aliens. How do you know that? How can you say with a certainty, if you have no natural explanation at this point, that it's definitely not extraterrestrial technology? I just don't understand how you can come to that conclusion, especially when there is a very, very good theory that meets with all of the qualifications of fast radio bursts and explains how extraterrestrial civilizations, very advanced ones, could make use of technology that produced artificial fast radio bursts to propel unbelievable payloads to relativistic speeds and actually conquer the stars. And if you think I'm exaggerating, well, we're going to go into this study, which was performed by one of my favorites, Dr. Avi Loeb, the former chair of Harvard Astrophysics, certainly not a man who uh, didn't have a reputation to uphold and still has an extremely respected reputation. Not just him, but others as well have collaborated on this project, and I want to go into depth and discuss the possibility, merely the possibility, that what we we are seeing across the universe from at least some of these fast radio bursts is evidence of the ultimate method of interstellar travel that eventually gets figured out by every advanced extraterrestrial civilization. Yep, as I said, it's going to get a little bit weird, so hang on, we're getting started right now. 
Now, the reason that science fiction shows and television always show spaceships coming out of wormholes or some other kind of warp or hyperspeed or something is because getting close to the speed of light is so incredibly difficult. And traveling from star to star is equally difficult simply because of the relationship of matter to energy. If you want to get anywhere near the speed of light, you need to convert matter directly into energy as fuel and use it to propel your ship. And we're talking about a tremendous amount of matter, even if you're using something like a matter-antimatter drive. It's virtually impossible to get to speeds like 99% of the speed of light or even 50% of the speed of light using methods that we understand today. However, if you could reach those kinds of speeds, amazing things start to happen. Time, for example, slows down for the individuals on the ship. So if you were traveling at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, for example, traveling to the Andromeda galaxy two and a half million light years away would take only 28 years on the ship itself. And traveling to other galaxies would be even more possible. The further you travel at this amazing speed, the more that time will slow down for you to where you could theoretically reach the end of the universe. But how do you accomplish this when it would take many tons of antimatter fuel just to get one kilogram up to this speed? Well, the trick is to not carry fuel at all. And this is the reason why I feel that this is the ultimate form of interstellar travel. And that is to propel a vessel that carries no fuel of its own, but relies instead on the power of a transmitter that pushes it along, much as wind pushes a sailing ship, either a highly reflective light sail or a finely woven wire mesh pushed by microwaves. And interestingly enough, microwaves that we generate here on Earth are surprisingly similar to fast radio bursts, to the extent that one time an open microwave oven repeatedly confused Australian astrophysicists about what they thought was fast radio bursts, but was actually their own microwave oven throwing their readings off. Now, the most basic application of this kind of technology was proposed by the physicist Robert L. Forward, who really liked creating things like this, and it was called the Star Wisp. It was a finely woven mesh, one kilometer in diameter, that would push a tiny probe that would weigh only a few grams, using, using our modern day technology in terms of miniaturization is concerned, at 115 Gs for only a few days by a 10 G gigawatt microwave transmitter, or gigawatt depending on your mood, and this would be enough to push this probe to a speed of 20% that of light, and could theoretically be used with today's technology. Now in their paper linked in the description entitled Fast Radio Bursts from Extra Galactic Light Sails, Dr. Avi Loeb together with his colleague Dr. Mansavi Lingham argue that fast radio bursts and their particular frequency would actually be ideal for pushing just such a light sail. And of course one of the reasons that they're so ideal is because they seem artificial by their nature. One of the reasons why microwave ovens can give off similar types types of transmissions. A very interesting coincidence. And it's interesting also that Dr. Loeb would propose this because he also proposed what's called the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, which involves light sails rather than radio sails, but nevertheless, something that's pushed by a very powerful array on Earth and carries no fuel of its own. Very similar to Star Wisp, except a whole bunch of sails propelled by by a massive laser array either on Earth or in orbit to Alpha Centauri or Proxima Centauri. Now, even though Dr. Loeb's critics have admired this particular proposal, especially considering that it could theoretically be done with today's technology, therefore making interstellar exploration a possibility, they also say that it's an amazing coincidence that he started to find evidence of the same thing in other star systems, as if he's imagining light sails, or in some cases microwave sails, all over the universe after he came up with it. 
this idea. Now that may be true, but it doesn't change the fact that this is a remarkably good way to travel from star to star, and perhaps the only practical way. Now, regardless of their motivations, Drs. Loeb and Lingham make a very compelling argument. First of all, they say that not all fast radio bursts are artificial, but rather only those that produce what's called coherent emission, that is, many electrons bunching up and radiating in phase rather than independently, which is what happens in a radio antenna driven by an artificial electron current, by the way. Very interesting coincidence that something in nature behaves almost exactly like one of our radio antennas. They also argue that the reason that we see these signals for only a fraction of a second is because it is a beam of radio energy being directed at us for only a short span of time as it sweeps across our field of view, as it's pushing its light sail or radio sail driven craft along its way. The implications of this are pretty amazing because most of these fast radio bursts, or a large number of them anyway, tend to repeat, sometimes fairly frequently, which means you could have a central terminal driving a powerful radio beam pushing one fast vessel after another toward its destination. And when we're talking about vessels, we're talking about huge vessels and an enormous scale, far beyond our technology. but certainly something that we could imagine. Now, how huge are we talking here? Well, their calculations come to approximately the size of double the Earth's diameter, or perhaps a little bit less than that. An enormous megastructure, but still nothing compared to, say, a Dyson sphere. Certainly something within the capability of a civilization many thousands of years in advance of our own. But according to Loeb and Lingham's calculations, an array of that size powered by a solar array of similar size and water-cooled could produce a radio signal powerful enough to push a million ton radio sail with a million tons worth of cargo at 1G worth of acceleration indefinitely until it reached 99% of the speed of light, which would take approximately a year or so. Now, the sail itself would also be a megastructure of sorts, many thousands of kilometers across, but still incredibly thin, and the payload would either be pushed or pulled behind it, kind of like a chariot behind a team of horses. But what incredible horses these would be, and it wouldn't be dependent on fuel at all. It would simply accelerate up to the limitations that relativity allows it, and it would travel to its destination destination at relativistic speeds. Now, how the hell do you slow down? Well, there's a couple of ways to accomplish that as well. This particular example is for a light sail as proposed by Dr. Forward. It involves what's called the deceleration stage, a highly reflective mirror-like stage at the end of the entire setup. And what this does is reflects light back onto the original sail, having been made porous with part of it detaching after the ship reaches the desired speed, and the reflected light slows the vessel down over a long period of time as it approaches its destination, but there is another form of deceleration called photogravitational assist, and I have a paper linking that particular method in the description. Put in its simplest terms, this method simply advocates that you use the energy of the sun that you're approaching on the reverse side of your sail, which would be just as reflective or absorbent depending on what kind of system you're using, in order to slow down continuously, especially once you start to enter the solar system, and you make a very close approach to the sun in question, which would slow you down enormously. Now, it wouldn't slow you down from 90 99% of the speed of light, but this would only be necessary for the first mission, so you wouldn't have to send it out that fast. You could send an unmanned expedition out in the first mission, perhaps at 20% of the speed of light, to set up a receiving radio transmitter to decelerate your vessels that are arriving at higher speed later on. Granted, this is a process that would take many years to accomplish, but still, if we're talking about a 
civilization that's been around for tens of thousands or perhaps even millions of years, it might not be that long in the overall scheme of things. But come on, why would you need such massive radio transmitters the size of planets and million ton payloads anyway? Well, because traveling to another star system might very well be a one-way trip for you. Because even though time would pass more slowly as far as you're concerned because of time dilation, it would of course pass at the same speed for the people you left behind. Meaning that a journey that only took a few decades for you would take millions of years back in your home system. Essentially, going to your new home would be your last stop, which means you would want to send an entire colony of people, or whatever these creatures are, to a new destination at once, therefore justifying a million ton payload. And why undertake this journey at all? Well, for the same reason that we would colonize our own solar system. After many thousands of years, or perhaps millions of years, of colonizing and being restricted within their own solar system, another civilization might decide that expanding outward is the only way to preserve the longevity of their species. Or perhaps they simply have a wanderlust and a natural desire to explore as we do. It's very difficult to say what the motivations might be, but one of the reasons that we might find these things all over the universe is because this is in fact the best way to travel from star to star, and all advanced civilizations at some point in their history discover this fact. Now, of course, all of this is purely theoretical. It is just speculation. However, given that a natural explanation for all fast radio bursts, or even the vast majority of them, continues to elude us, and also given the fact that an artificial explanation is not only very advantageous to interstellar travel, but also bears a close resemblance to the kinds of radio emissions emitted by our own technology, so much so that microwave emissions from our own devices, such as a microwave oven, can confuse our readings, this should indicate to us that there is at least the possibility that someone out there is using artificial fast radio bursts to travel between the stars, or perhaps for some other purpose that we have yet to figure out. It is best to keep an open mind about such things, because the possibilities associated with them are truly amazing. Now I want to make one thing perfectly clear as always. I do not absolutely believe that fast radio bursts are the product of extraterrestrial civilizations, or that some of them are, or even that one of them is. I am not claiming with absolute certainty that this is the case. However, as natural explanations for all of these things begin to fall flat, magnetars create some of them, but not all of them. How is it that we have the same phenomenon being created in some cases in nature by extremely active young neutron stars, and then in other cases seemingly coming out of nowhere? How does this happen? How do you get this level of consistency in these sorts of events without the same kind of source, without the same kind of natural cause. It doesn't make any sense. And as natural explanation after natural explanation falls and is debunked or is simply proven with further evidence to simply not be the case, we must start to turn to artificial explanations. It is the next rational conclusion. And Dr. Loeb and associates laid out this theory extremely well. It explains everything about fast radio bursts and the coincidences associated with it. The fact that they are so well suited to interstellar travel, to light sails designed to function off of high energy radio waves rather than light, and the fact that the frequency of these things just happens to be ideal. It's an interesting coincidence. Why wouldn't it be the case that an extraterrestrial civilization says, wow, these magnetars produce an amazing 
uh, type of radio burst that would be incredibly useful if this was in our solar system. Pity it would kill everybody, but what if we made one ourselves and made it a directional beam so it didn't kill everybody and it would be we could use it to propel things and we only saw as i mentioned in the video just the briefest flash of these things as they're going by as they sweep by our field of vision and we're only seeing you know a tiny percentage of them the ones that happen to be pointed in our direction there could be some in our own galaxy that are simply not in our way you know, not within our field of vision. And this is something that we're not going to be able to discover for quite some time, although the advent of greater and more advanced radio astronomy is going to reveal so many more of these phenomena. And it's all going to be quite fascinating. Gamma ray bursts, just as mysterious. One of these days, I'll do a video on that too. But still, I think it is so absurdly narrow-minded on the part Part of the scientific community to dismiss an artificial explanation every time just because it's an artificial explanation. Not because it, it isn't valid. It is actually a very valid theory that supports all of the evidence. So why not look upon it as a legitimate theory? Because it involves little green men. And oh, we can't have that. That's like those UFO freaks and the people who make ancient aliens. We can't be associated with those people. It is truly unfortunate. And I wish there was some way of segregating, you know, the, <laughs> the extremists in the, uh, in the UFO file group. And I'm not saying all those people are crazy. There's certainly, you know, some interesting stuff happening as far as that's concerned right now with the government revealing information about all of this. But there's observational data that's gathered by scientists, astrophysicists, and astronomers that can be quantified and turned into valid theories. That is the kind of information that I regard as being worth making a video about. And if we eventually have observational data in great detail about UFOs here on our own planet, then I'll make a video about it. But currently we don't. It's still kind of under wraps, but still, we cannot dismiss these things simply because it's an artificial explanation, as if there are no advanced alien species in the universe. What utter arrogance, and yet it is in our nature as a species to be arrogant. If you like what I talk about, if you like my mannerisms and my bluntness, as I've always said before, it's all in the description, many ways to support my channel, or if you'd just like to throw me a like and a subscribe, I would be very, very appreciative. So until the scientific community is willing to examine artificial and technological explanations for astro astro astronomical phenomena, rather than just sticking to natural explanations, explanations and completely refusing to wander any place else, regardless of whether or not they have any evidence or not, until they're willing to stop being so damn narrow-minded, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.